All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the second part of a professional development opportunity um, related to data collection and specifically uh, pulling data related to CED. The first part, um, there, we have it up on the website. Um, you can find um, a slew of resources that were provided by Matt and Steve uh, during that session. Um, again, direct access to the links that were shared during that time, um, as well as their PowerPoint slides and then also the video. So if you would like those as resources, you can find those. I just dropped it in the chat. Um, and today is a follow up to that. And it will be now that you know how to get the data, what do you do with it? And what are some techniques to be able to apply that data? And so with that, um, again, similar to last time, our presenters are comfortable with questions, either via chat or interrupting or using your raise hand function. So please feel free to do so uh, as we go through. Um, and we will have some opportunity for question and answer a little bit later as well. So with that, I will turn it over to Matt, who is going to take the lead. So Matt, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Does everyone see the slides okay? Thumbs up, all right, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. It's great to see all your wonderful smiling faces. Um, and as Brandon said, we are going to look at part two of a series we're presenting to you on how to access and use data for community economic development. And today, as Brandon said, we are going to move from uh, how do you access this data or pull it from different resources across uh, the internet and actually transform it into useful information that will help you, hopefully, in your daily jobs. Um, and one of the things, as we mentioned, that we'd like to do is, is move from this idea of just having raw data to creating information. And this is a creativity pyramid that uh, Steve shared last time. And one of the things that we, we mentioned in our earlier presentation is that we are drowning in data. We have so much data available to us. It does make it difficult for kind of the average user to take this data and turn it into something useful for your stakeholders. So today we're gonna to take um, some views of some, some very basic indicators and, and basic measures that we often use in community economic development and use those in terms of real life examples that we often get uh, in terms of questions from our stakeholders, in terms of comparisons of trends or conditions of variables of interest and variables of interest could be all sorts of demographic or economic uh, indicators or measures. We'll also look at growth indices or how uh, we can look at change over time for different measures or indicators. And we'll also look at location quotients that I know many of you are also familiar with and have used um, in, in the past and in, in, in many of the activities that you do. Uh, so we'll spend some time going through these different indicators and, and again, using some examples uh, that we encountered in, in uh, our real life work. And then if we have time at the end and any of you want to go through kind of a step-by-step -step process of downloading this information and doing some of these calculations uh, yourself, we'll have a bit of a, an office hours that uh, we'll, we'll spend some time working one-on-one -on -one with you if, if we want and have time. So I think, I think uh, one of the most basic ways that we can think about how to take our data and turn it into information is just look at simple comparisons of trends or conditions for the different variables of interest that we all work with on a regular basis. So a lot of times you might get questions from a, a, a county board member or a business or your economic development corporation looking at, hey, what's our home occupancy rate? or uh, what's their educational attainment in terms of the shares of individuals that have a high school degree or higher, or what's their unemployment rate, or what's their labor participation rate. And these are really basic measures that we can use just to, to answer those types of questions we get and, and add value to our work. But it's also interesting and useful to compare these types of uh, metrics and, and measures across different geographies. So if we're just asked for a simple number, uh, it doesn't really provide context in terms of whether we're higher or lower than our neighboring counties or the state or national average. And it's also useful to look at how these uh, measures look across time as well. So are we growing? Uh, are we declining? Are we staying stagnant? Um, so. A lot of times what we want to do is not just answer the question we get, 
but also maybe provide some additional value by making these types of comparisons. And hopefully when we do these uh, types of comparisons, it helps us ask better questions. So as we mentioned again, last time we drown in data because so many times we, we can just provide oodles and oodles of data, but it doesn't really help us get at the root of the issue that we're often dealing with. So again, a lot of times when we provide this information, it'll help us ask better questions to get at uh, the root of the issue that may be at hand. And I know a lot of times too, um, when we look at these types of measures, uh, we're often asked for rankings or um, we uh, kind of get lost in the fact that we may rank 71st out of 72 Wisconsin counties or the state of Wisconsin is first in some measure or another. But a lot of times these rankings can be a, a, a bit misleading. So my suggestion is to not dismiss rankings necessarily, but focus more on comparisons. And, and really the, the, the primary reasons for this is that rankings often suggest that there may be some sort of formula of success that can be looked at higher ranked areas. How many times have we heard over the years that uh, we wanna become the next Silicon Valley? Well, you can't become the next Silicon Valley. There's, there's so many other issues at hand and, and historical factors that allowed this place to grow the way it did. And we simply can't replicate that uh, very easily where we are. And think of all the other uh, sh shiny red buttons in terms of economic development that we've been presented with over the years, whether it be uh, the creative class or um, you, you name it. Um, simply looking at rankings of these measures is not gonna help us grow in the way we want to. Uh, and also, a lot of times we look at rankings, it may actually increase inequality. If we rank very low in one of these measures, um, it may be uh, continuing to stigmatize uh, a, a given region because of these low rankings that, that come out over and over and over again. And a lot of times these rankings are due to deficiencies that are simply beyond our control. So uh, be a little bit careful with your rankings, but do use comparisons. And when you use comparisons, you can certainly look at how a given area may compare, as I mentioned before, to state and national averages, but also compare it to your neighboring counties, your neighboring communities. You may also wanna look at how you stack up in terms of measures related to uh, if you're a college town, maybe looking at other communities or, or counties that have a very large college population or seasonal recreational homes or uh, tourism destinations, uh, manufacturing centers, so on and so forth. These can provide some good um, uh, perspective in terms of how a given measure looks in our community versus another community. Um, before Matt moves on to the next thing, this comparison is really um, important because oftentimes what communities wanna do is they wanna compare themselves to their neighbors. And when we're talking about economic data, particularly economic trends, those neighbors, are probably not sufficiently different to actually separate out what's happening. Because a lot of times what's happening to your local economy is part of what's happening to a larger regional economy. So your neighboring counties may be experiencing the exact same trends that you are. And that looks, then that becomes kind of, well, that's normal, that's what's happening. So it's really, Matt kind of says, you know, look to other places that are outside of your immediate region uh, for comparisons. And I think that's really important. Um, one of the challenges that we have oftentimes is that we can pick some place that say on the other side of the state or indeed in another state. And sometimes that becomes a challenge because when we start to say, let's compare ourselves to um, a similar county in say Missouri, uh, the, the tendency is to push back and say, well, that's not Wisconsin, that's not us. And that's something that I think that we can kind of, you know, the economy is the same. The local context might be different, but I think it's really important to, to go outside of your immediate neighboring communities to make these comparisons. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> So let's jump in and look at uh, an example of using uh, a comparison of commuting patterns for Green County. And this looks at data that was pulled from uh, a resource called On the Map that we looked at last time. And what we're simply looking at here is the share of residents that live in Green County 
that also have a job that remain in Greene County for their place of employment versus the share of residents in Greene County that have a job that commute to Dane County. So again, we're just looking at some, some basic figures here in terms of overall share of destinations for commuters, and we're looking at it across a 17 year period. But what we see here in, in looking at these numbers is that the share of people who remain in Greene County for their place of employment has gone down over time. And the share of Greene County residents who commute to Dane County has increased somewhat over time. And a lot of times employers or county economic development uh, professionals may wonder why this is happening. You know, why are we seeing a greater share of, of people commuting out? Why don't these individuals want to stay in Greene County and work for Greene County companies? So I guess I'll ask you then, when you look at these trends, what types of questions about either the economy or the labor market uh, do these trends raise? And we think about those questions, what other types of data should we consider looking at, you know, based on some of the resources we looked at last time, or some of the resources that you may know of as well. So with that, you, you can either answer uh, these questions in the chat, or you can unmute yourself and provide some perspectives, but um, what types of other questions should we be thinking about when we look at this type of data? First thing that I'd look at is whether there have been a, a change in major employers. Okay. Because um, that uh, could have an impact. And just because, and also sometimes there's a difference in the way um, employers report their employees. They re may report them all out of one uh, central office and actually have um, a large percentage of their employees in, um, in another county and not been consistent in the way they employ it. Yep, you have multiple site issues sometimes in reporting with data sets like uh, QCW, um, that, that's certainly a consideration, but uh, there could be some other factors too. Any other ideas? One of the things that I'm seeing in some of our telecommuting, well, it seems like people are telecommuting, but it looks like they're commuting. <laughs> Um, and so maybe they're actually employed by a firm in Minneapolis, but they live up north in Bayfield County. Um, and so that, that sort of seems like it's skewing some of our numbers as to who's working where. Hmm. And that's a really good point. And um, I think when we look at some of the newer data that comes out after the um, onset of the pandemic, we'll probably see some of those trends show up in the data. Uh, but what we see here, this goes up through 2019, and we actually see it, you know, really start to change with the onset of the, the Great Recession. Um, so we didn't see a whole lot of telecommuting occurring here anyway. Uh, could there be some other things that, that come up? Shannon um, put into the chat box relative housing prices, and I think that that's extremely important. Um, one of the things that one of the largest factors that drives in and out commuting, particularly out commuting, is, is relative housing prices. Um, and we're seeing more of that uh, with the current kind of housing crisis. So that's, a, that's an excellent point, Sharon. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? So housing I, is definitely, yeah, go ahead, Steve. I think this is, I think Matt throwing these questions up there is really important because if you go back to the creativity pyramid, what we're trying to do is get a better understanding of what's happening to the local economy. So oftentimes you'll ask a question like commuting patterns. And a lot of times you'll find that you end up with more questions than you have answers. And that's part of the kind of the research process, if you will. So that's one of the things that we, you know, we're looking for surprises uh, when we look at this data. And, and the reason that we're looking for surprises is that it kind of helps us refine our questions and actually kind of expand our thinking about what's actually happening to the regional economy. So certainly housing and a couple other things to think about are the, the types of commuters that are making these trips. So it may come down to certainly housing, but also the types of jobs that are available in Greene County versus Dane 
in county, which also ties into to housing indirectly, and the earnings that individuals can make. So if we look at the individuals who remain in Greene County versus those who commute to Dane County, and we break it down in terms of the monthly earnings of these individuals and the types of industries that they work in, we can see, not surprisingly, that the people who commute to Dane County are commuting because they're earning higher wages in Dane County than they probably can earn in Greene County. We can also see that the types of industries that these individuals work in are a bit different as well. So we see a higher share of people commuting to Dane County for uh, individuals working in all other services, which is kind of a catch-all category, than the share of individuals remaining in Greene County. So there may be a bit of a mismatch in the types of jobs and, and earnings that are available in Greene County versus those in Dane County. And certainly, as Sharon and Steve both mentioned, we can look at housing costs. So if you can commute to Dane County and earn higher wages and commute back to or return to Greene County for your place of residence and have a cheaper house or a less expensive house, that might make a lot of sense to individuals. And this looks at another data set we showed last time from the Federal Reserve of uh, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And this looks at the all transactions house price index for Greene County versus Dane County. And we can see that the growth in housing prices for Dane County has is higher and has continued to distance itself from the transactions house price index for Greene County. So again, this makes a lot of sense. And if we're an economic developer in, in Greene County, maybe we're thinking about, is this possibly an advantage for us? Can we attract people that wanna live in Greene County for quality of life or all sorts of other factors, housing costs, and still be um, uh, in commuting distance to employment centers? Okay, let's shift gears a little bit and look at another um, commonly used measure. And this is a, a growth index or growth indices. And all we're doing here is simply comparing how a given variable has uh, grown over time. So we're looking at, say, population or employment or income or some other variable and looking at how that variable has changed between uh, a given year and a base year. And this is really useful in looking things, looking at measures like population change, because if we're simply looking at total population change from one place to the next, it, 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 it's not really useful to look at the overall population change because the, the overall size of one county may be much larger or smaller than another we want to compare it to. So this kind of puts everything on a, a similar basis so we can look at change across geographies and across time. So let's do that for Green County again. So here we have Green County uh, population change from 1969 to 2020. The index of growth starts in 1969 and goes all the way up for um, several decades here. And here we're putting the basis uh, at 100. So we did the calculations, we multiplied them by 100 just to make it a little bit easier to understand. And one of the things we see here is that if we look at Green County's index of growth over this period, we can see that uh, it grew a bit faster than the state of Wisconsin uh, over this period. We can see that the United States grew faster than both Green County and uh, the state of Wisconsin. But we also see Dane County grew even faster than these other comparison areas on the chart and significantly faster than Greene County. So if Greene County had some sort of advantage in terms of housing costs, how come Dane County was able to grow so much faster than Greene County over this period? So again, what types of questions about the community or county to these trends raise. So again, feel free to drop uh, your answers in the chat or unmute and, and provide some, some perspectives that you think this data provides or uh, shows. Any other thoughts? While you're thinking, go back and think about the growth in the number of people commuting from Green County into Dane County, and look at the relative flat population growth of Green County. 
one of the things that that suggests to me is that it's not people moving into Greene County and commuting in. If they were moving into Greene County to commute into Dane County, you would see growth in population. But we're not seeing that. So what's that suggesting is that people that already lived in Greene County are taking jobs in Dane County. It's these little layers of insight that you're really trying to get at. This is the information that gives you knowledge uh, about what's the local economy. And once you have that knowledge, then you can start to implement um, you know, innovative policies. So in the chat, Sharon mentioned um, what is driving the rate of growth in Dane County, what jobs are available, what is happening in Greene County regarding jobs. So that kind of gets at some of the the issues that, that Steve just raised. Uh, James mentioned more housing is being built in Dane County because there's more possibility for profit. So housing, again, um, could be a big part of it. Any other thoughts? Dale, is green. I don't think you completed your... Well, it's a, the thought was... Is it because uh, Green County is older and it's replacing the population that's dying off in Green County? So just compare the death rate that's going on and you might have a net, uh, not an increase or a decrease, but could that be something that's occurring? I don't know what the natural increase in, in uh, Green County looks at off the top of my head, but uh, again, these are the types of questions that we may want to pose and, and use data to answer. This also points to um, this definition of what do we mean by rural? Um, the, the traditional way is we use the metropolitan, non-metropolitan um, definition. And Greene County has become classified as a metropolitan county. You would think, well, that's because population growth, right? It's so close to Madison, it's so close to Dane County that you've got population growth going there. Well, it's not population growth. That's not what's driving it. Greene County became classified as a metropolitan county because of the changes in the commuting pattern. Now, if you go into Greene County and you tell the typical resident of Greene County, hey, you live in a metropolitan county, they're probably going to ask you, what have you been smoking? But that's the way that we make these definitions. And it's not being driven by population growth, it's being driven by the commuting patterns. So one of the other measures we may want to look at then is looking at our housing stock. So we may have cheaper relative housing stock than Dane County, but if we're not building the types of housing that people want in terms of um, rental units or multifamily units or the um, uh, size of new uh, owner-occupied units in Green County, then people aren't able to move to Green County. There's simply not housing available for them. So we may want to look at the distribution of uh, the types of housing available in Greene County and see what that looks like relative to Dane County, or as Steve said, in some other similar uh, uh, rural or, or adjacent metropolitan counties uh, throughout Wisconsin or throughout the upper Midwest. So that may give us some insight into um, why people aren't moving into Greene County or why population is not growing in Greene County, because there's simply not the housing stock available for them. And we may look at this data and say, well, you know what, that's not the answer either. We may want to look at other factors too. Do we have quality places that people want to live, want to move to? Do we have um, the types of schools that people want? You know, there's many other factors that go into um, these types of trends that we may want to consider. And this is just, again, kind of using the data to help us ask those types of questions more effectively. Okay, one more measure we can consider is a uh, location quotient. And what a location quotient at its uh, most, most uh, basic is looking at the percent of a given measure locally versus the percent of a given measure nationally. 
You could also look at the percent of a given measure locally compared to the share um, within the state. It doesn't have to be always a national comparison, but a very a national comparison is very uh, common way to calculate location quotients. And a lot of times we'll use location quotients to look at the concentration or specialization of employment in a given industry sector or in a given occupation. So we might compare the share of say um, agricultural employment in a given county compared to the share nationally. And the critical values we're considering for location quotient are values that are under one. So that may uh, suggest that a given measure for um, a given industry is underspecialized. So perhaps there's potential for expansion there. Maybe there's opportunities to um, increase the share of local employment in a given industry to help um, uh, meet unmet demand. If we're at one, that means we're at the same share as we are nationally for a, a given uh, measure of employment for an industry sector or occupation. So that's probably what we'd expect in a lot of instances. And location quotients greater or one suggests that that sector or occupation may be specialized and it may be a driver of the local economy. So there's some reason uh, and some factors that we have locally that make it a good place for that industry or occupation to be. And that's bringing outside dollars into our community because we're selling more goods and services or producing more goods and services than can be consumed locally. And one's kind of a relative number. Um, a lot of times people look at numbers like 1.15 or 1.25 to kind of account some for some uh, variability in the data. Uh, but again, it's, it's just a, a basic way to look at how we stack up in a given measure compared to state or national averages. And that comparison, again, um, what is a fair comparison? It goes back to that kind of comparative places questions of you know you have a tendency you want to look at your immediate neighbors uh kind of the default here is to use the nation uh but is that a fair comparison uh because if we're looking at a rural wisconsin county is the nation really a fair comparison maybe the state's a, a better comparison um one of the things i i ask my students to do um to get comfortable with this data is i say okay i want you to do compute the location quotient based on three comparisons, the nation, the state, and then if you're the county that you're looking at is a metropolitan county, look at the metropol national metropolitan average. If it's a non-metropolitan county, compare it to a non-metropolitan national average. How much do these different comparisons agree and disagree? What kind of insights can you get by changing the reference set or the comparison set. Um, and you can, the students always kind of come back and say, well, um, I can tell whatever story I want to based on what my comparison is. I said, well, yeah, you've heard the joke, you know, give an economist long enough, we can make the data say anything we want to. That's not what we're trying to do here. What we're trying to do here is to get some kind of understanding of what's happening to the local economy. For example, if you if it's a non-metropolitan, you compare to the national average, you get one story. If you compare to the state of Wisconsin, you get a second story. If you compare to the national non-metropolitan average, you get a third story. Well, the truth is in there somewhere. And it's that insight that we're looking for. Thanks, Matt. So let's uh, keep building on our, our story from Greene County. And as Steve mentioned before, Greene County is part of the Madison Metropolitan Statistical Area, which is comprised of, of four counties. And here we can look at location quotients for different occupations that are located in the, in the entire MSA. And again, this data comes from one of the resources we showed you before, uh, which is from the Department of Workforce Development. You can also get it from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And they do the nice, uh, nice job of actually calculating location quotient for you, but you could simply use the formula we used on the prior slide and divide the share of employment in the Madison MSA from the share of employment in the United States or by the share of employment in the United States. And if we do that for all these occupational categories, um, starting with management, going all the way down to transportation material moving, 
you can see those that might be under specialized or over specialized in the Madison metropolitan area. And for the most part, what we see here in terms of specialization are four categories. We see business and financial operations, computer and mathematical occupations, architectural engineering, life physical and social sciences. So all of these are location quotients uh, above one or well above one. We see some other measures throughout here too that, that are close to one or um, a little bit below or a little bit above. So those might be ones that we want to have some additional interest in as well. But um, in terms of these occupations, we may wanna ask ourselves if we're in Green County, okay, if that's a specialization for the entire metropolitan area, is that something we're trying to actively pursue in terms of the types of economic development initiatives we are putting forth in Green County? And if we're not, maybe there's a good reason we're not doing that. Maybe there's uh, some sort of factors that uh, preclude us from doing so. But again, maybe we wanna look at these numbers and think about the types of strategies we're putting into place to grow our economy. Before and, you move on, before you move on, Matt, go, go back to that last slide. Yeah. Why do you think the Madison metropolitan area is so high in computer and mathematical? Let's skip the architecture and engineering, the life, physical and social sciences. Why do you think those are so high? Chris says university spinoff, or is it the university itself? Okay. I would suspect it's the university itself. Increasingly, it's the spinoffs, you're right. But I would say it's the university itself. So if I'm in Greene County and I'm thinking economic development and I'm thinking life, physical, and social sciences, um, if that large location quotient is being explained by the university, then, and we want to pursue that, how do we, is that a reasonable pursuit? I mean, is the university going to set up a, a, a satellite campus just to get, get those numbers up? Probably not. But as Chris pointed out, maybe there's spinoffs that are coming out. Increasingly in Madison, some of these spinoffs in the life and physical sciences are having a really hard time spinning off because of the cost of lab space in Madison. The cost of lab space is really expensive. Ah, maybe Green County could think about that way. If Madison's too expensive for your spinoffs because of lab space, you know, hey, look just down the road. Okay, it's those insights that we're starting to get knowledge about the local economy. And that knowledge gives us the opportunity to be kind of innovative. Thanks, Matt. Well, another way we can think about location quotients is in terms of whether or not they are part of perhaps an industry cluster of some sort. And traditionally, uh, Michael Porter, who has been a big proponent of industry clusters, um, has, has looked at a different way to slice and dice industry clusters based on uh, quadrants of growth and strength in terms of location quotients. So we can look at uh, location quotients in terms of whether or not a given industry or occupation is above or below one and how the location quotient may have changed over time. So if we look at this uh, upper right quadrant, we can think about industry cluster or industries or occupations that have uh, grown over time and also are above one. So they are a strength and growing. So a lot of times when we think about types of industries or occupations we may want to devote some resources to, it's often those that economic developers were, will consider that are fall in this quadrant. We can also look at different industries and occupations in terms of location quotients, in terms of those that are above one and perhaps declining, those that are below one and also declining, or those that are below one and uh, growing. So those might be emerging clusters that should, should say growing there. 
So if we do that and we do that uh, comparison for the Madison metro area for computer and mathematical occupations and compare Madison to in terms of how its uh, computer mathematical occupations have changed over time relative to all the other metro areas between 250,000 residents and just under a million residents, we can see that Madison does fall in that upper right quadrant. We can see that it has one of the highest location quotients of any mid-sized metro area and has some of the largest increase in uh, its location quotient over this period. So again, Steve kind of brought this up before. So why is this happening? So certainly we, we talked about the role of the university. We also talked about the role of spinoffs. Another big one, which was a spinoff, is Epic Systems. Epic Systems employs over 10,000 individuals in health medical records in uh, Verona. So it's a huge employer and a bit of a growth pole uh, for this occupational category in the Madison metro area. So maybe we're not going to um, attract some of those uh, large employers in terms of this category, but when we think about things like remote work, maybe we attract some of the people that work at some of these large employers in the Madison metro area. So if we think about uh, strategies related to things like telecommuting and quality of place and placemaking, perhaps there's an opportunity here if we have the proper broadband infrastructure to attract some of these workers to live in our communities instead of having them commute into Madison from, from Green County. So there's all sorts of different ways that we can look at this, but again, having this data and looking at it in, in different manners helps us ask these types of questions and perhaps helps us inform the types of strategy that we may want to pursue going forward. While Matt's shifting slides, the other another thing is look at the time period that was examined there in terms of the change in location quotient. There's no hard and fast rule of what the time frame is to look at. And it can actually be kind of insightful in terms of say, well, let's look at a five-year time period. Let's look at a 10-year time period. Let's look at a 15, 20-year time period. And do we get a different story based on those different time frames? There is a fair amount of judgment calls that need to come into play here uh, in terms of the time frame. Um, I kind of you know talked about the BEA Reese data that Matt showed the population that goes all the way back to 1969. Do you really want to go back that far? Or do you want to keep it a shorter time period? There's no right or wrong answer to that. But when you're doing the analysis, oftentimes it's really insightful to kind of change it and say, let's look at 10 year increments, let's look at five year increments. What does this, what happens to the story? This is essentially playing with the data. And by playing with the data, you get those additional insights. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and I think uh, what Steve just mentioned there is, is really important because you may be a little shy in terms of doing some of these calculations at first, but once you get your hands dirty, this is really how you learn how to use this data more effectively. Uh, just by doing it once or twice, you know, it, it's gonna be helpful, but the more you slice and dice it, look at different time periods, look at different measures, look at uh, different geographies and, and, and types of comparisons, these are gonna provide the, these comparisons are gonna provide the types of insights that are gonna help you um, do your job more effectively. So let's uh, provide another example here with location quotients. And instead of using occupations, let's look at employment by industry sector. And we're shifting gears from uh, Green County, Wisconsin to Sheboygan County, Wisconsin. And again, we've calculated location quotient for uh, a number of different industry sectors for a given year. And if we look at the results of those calculations, we see uh, quite a few industry sectors with location quotients uh, below one or well below one. So perhaps there's opp opportunities for expansion there. But we also see one with a really high location quotient and that's manufacturing. So almost 30% of Sheboygan County's employment is in the manufacturing sector and they have a location quotient of 4.41. So to us, that should say that manufacturing is a perhaps a, a very large strength or concentration for Sheboygan County. 
So let's uh, look at this in a little more detail. So let's look at location quotient trends for Sheboygan County manufacturing over time. So going back to 2001 up through 2020, um, as Steve said, we could go back even farther and look at how this has changed over time, but just for purposes of, of keeping this uh, simple for now, just back to uh, 2001, so about a 20 year period. And what we see here is that the location quotient for Sheboygan County manufacturing actually went up over this time from 3.47 to 4.41. And this was higher than the increase for the overall location quotient for the state of Wisconsin. But let's also look at manufacturing employment as a percent of total employment over this period. And here we see a, a different perspective. We went from 35.5% of total employment back in 2001 down to 296 so you're probably saying to yourself, well, how can the location quotient go up while the share of employment went down? Well, the reality is that the share of employment went down at a lesser rate than the national average. So it allowed the location quotient to increase. All right, so that gives us a little different story. Now let's look at the index of growth. And here you also see that the total employment manufacturing went down over this period. And we can see that uh, starting with the Great Recession, it went down quite a bit. It's bounced back somewhat, but again, overall employment in manufacturing is quite a bit lower than it was in 2001. So when we're looking at this data, we want, probably want to ask ourselves, for Sheboygan County, is manufacturing a strength given the location quotient? Maybe it's a, a weakness given the fact that it, we're so reliant on it and it's gone down in terms of total employment over time. Perhaps there's an opportunity there because it has rebounded somewhat, somewhat over the last several years. Maybe there's an opportunity for it to grow again. Or is it a threat because we have so much reliance on manufacturing and um, perhaps uh, if we do see big changes in the sector like we've seen in, in previous uh, economic downturns, perhaps it's a large threat for us. But in reality, it's maybe some combination of above. So, I mean, what do you all think? Is it a strength, weakness? opportunity threat if you were working in Sheboygan County and you look at these numbers what would you say to yourselves and to your your stakeholders any thoughts I think the reference point of the United States and Wisconsin is crucially important um, regardless of what's happening in Sheboygan it seems like there's a broader trend that's you know bigger than the local area that would be telling about um, it may be a strength and it would continue to be something that's a strength but it would be also a threat because it seems like to be a downward decline um, across all those major areas and uh, another thing we want to do maybe we want to do here is to look at the the uh, the types of manufacturing located in Sheboygan County Maybe there are some subsectors of manufacturing that are doing really well, and maybe one that's pulling these numbers down. So we may want to look at it in greater detail to get a better sense of the types of manufacturing that are present in Sheboygan County. Elizabeth put in the chat, um, over-dependence on one industry, it's a threat. I think that's an excellent point. The other thing too here is, um, Matt capped it started with 20 uh, or 2001. If you go back until uh, 1969, which is when this particular data set starts, what do you think manufacturing employment would look like over a much longer time period? And what I'm trying to what I'm trying to hint at here is look at what happened in the Great Recession. If we had a longer time period and we had more recessions in the in the time period, what do you think manufacturing employment would look like? For the sake of time, um, manufacturing, it's, manufacturing declining. it's declining, but it's also very unstable. It bounces around a lot. It's very sensitive to the business or to the business cycle. Now, for comparison purposes, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll put in what's happening to manufacturing employment over time. And then as a comparison, I'll put in what's happening to the healthcare sector. 
what's happening to the healthcare sector over the same time period. It's exploding in terms of employment and it's extremely stable. So the takeaway here looking at manufacturing is that, and Matt, if I'm taking away your, your, your thunder here, I apologize, is that if you looked at that kind of Porter uh, uh, four quadrant, you would look at manufacturing, you go, ooh, big location quotient and it's getting bigger. Great, we should focus on manufacturing. Wait a minute, time out. Let's look at manufacturing itself. Well, it's actually declining but it's not declining as fast as the nation. So that denominator is getting smaller, faster than the numerator. That's why that location quotient is going up. Also manufacturing by its nature is very unstable. So if we go after manufacturing, we're going after a declining industry and we're going after an unstable industry. So we're again, Using the data, we're getting information, we're get, starting to better understand, and that helps us come up with better policies. And so, we'll, we'll end looking at a, a couple additional slides here, and it, it, it kind of, again, gets to, um, yeah, go ahead. I think someone was trying to chime in. But oh, I sure, sure. I was. I, yeah, just looking at the, the 2009 area, you could also look at what they did right during that time, because that was also a huge dip in manufacturing. And they, it doesn't appear, I mean, while they took a hit, it doesn't look like it was that bad. So you could also, you know, check on what the history was of it and see where there's more opportunities to bring some of that back. And that's a great point. Um, and again, I think that's where those comparisons can be really useful. You know, if we compared how, even though we lost jobs over that period, we didn't lose them as fast as some other places. So what did we do well? Did we have good retention plans in place? Were we working locally with our employers? Um, again, maybe the, the types of manufacturing we had was more resilient to that economic downturn. You know, so this, this type of analysis gives us the ability to ask those types of questions and, and learn from them. Also, there's um, from the first, we talked about two different types of information or two different types of data, formal, which is what we're looking at here, and then informal, is that local knowledge of trying to help understand what's happening in Sheboygan County. That local knowledge is extremely important. So and I'm sure in, in many of your communities, you, you're, you're getting the same question that uh, we have on the bottom of the slide there. And you could probably substitute manufacturing for other industries as well. But if we're seeing this decline in overall employment in, in an industry like manufacturing, why are all the employers coming to me and saying they can't find the, the number of workers that they need? So you, they may be saying, well, people are lazy, don't want to work, or people, you know, are... are um, you can work other places and so on and so forth. There's lots of reasons, but again, we can use data and information to help maybe answer these, these types of questions. Uh, James, do you have a, a point? Yeah, I mean, I mean, wouldn't it be the change in the age of the uh, population? You know, yeah. the workforce wor workforce is shrinking based on retirement. Thanks for that softball, James. Um, <laughs> Leading right into your next slide. Right. And, and again, this is there's many different ways that we can and look at how uh, the employment base has changed over time. But one of them is just simply look at the age structure of individuals working in, in Sheboygan County manufacturing, as well as the overall employment base for all industries. And we can see that if you were a manufacturer in the 1990s, where you're probably used to a pretty consistent age structure for um, for your manufacturing uh, employment base. And we see throughout the 2000s, the share of individuals age 55 and older, either nearing retirement or perhaps at retirement age has grown. And we can see that it's now quite a bit higher than it was back throughout the 1990s and even into 2001, the, the point of time we started looking at uh, data for the, the prior charts. So again, our age structure is changing. So it may be that there's simply not as many people available in the labor force and our labor force is starting to shrink in terms of individuals that are retiring. But we might also add some, some other, ask some other questions. We may look at things like the turnover rate. So 
are people at our businesses leaving their jobs more often than they used to? And if we look at the turnover rate or the share of people that, that um, left their job for a new job in a given quarter, we can see that if we go back to the end of the Great Recession, we do start to see this overall trend of increasing turnover rates. So if I'm a business, maybe I'm going to ask myself, are there things I can do to help retain the workers I already have instead of having them go to some other job opportunity elsewhere? Because when we have to hire new individuals, that's expensive. So maybe there's opportunities to increase wages. Maybe there's opportunities to provide additional perks, uh, flexible employment schedules, so on, so, and, and other types of amenities that we can give workers that we already I have. I know we're running out of time, but why did Henry Ford increase the wage rate to the extent that he did back in the 1920s. Everybody says that it's because he wanted his workers to be able to buy the products that they're making. I say BS. He had a huge employee turnover rate problem. Huge. It was, it was killing him. Well, figuratively, it was killing the business. He raised wages in order to, uh, to tackle the worker turnover problem. You know, and we can also use this data to look at other aspects of individuals working in different industries. So again, we may wanna think about, are we underrepresented or overrepresented in terms of our employment uh, across genders or across different racial or ethnic categories? Are there opportunities perhaps for us to uh, create, create new opportunities for employment for individuals that don't typically work in our sector. So if we look at trends in terms of female employment as a share of total em employment manufacturing, we can see it's gone up a little bit over time, but, but not very much at all, and is quite a bit lower than the overall share of employment um, from females in Sheboygan County. So again, if we're thinking about how to get new workers into our business and into our industry, perhaps there's different ways that we can look at the data to look at uh, where we're perhaps a little bit behind or perhaps where we're a little bit ahead and create new initiatives to try and address those, uh, those differences. So in summary, uh, I think uh, Steve covered this uh, fairly well in our, our very first presentation, but when we're looking at data, we're looking for uh, challenges. We're looking at things that surprise us. Uh, we're looking at broad insights, not necessarily precision down to two or three decimal points. And I think one of the things we tried to do today is look at what types of stories the data is trying to tell us. Just looking at one uh, statistic in terms of commuting on Green County, that helps us paint a story of the overall uh, economy and labor market. Looking at one statistic in terms of manufacturing in, in Sheboygan helps us paint a story in terms of what's going on with that industry uh, in one Wisconsin county. And certainly this is just scratching the surface. You know, there's lots of other ways that we can look at this, but, but it helps us ask those types of questions and helps us get a better understanding of what's happening in our communities. And I'll end with a couple of quotes that, uh, that I like in terms of, of how we use data and statistics. And I think Steve kind of alluded to this one before from Mark Twain, um, not directly in terms of a quotation, but um, thinking about its overall meaning. It ain't what you, what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So a lot of times we have these preconceptions about what's going on in our community. And a lot of times using data and turning it into information will help us overcome some of those perceptions. There's also three types of lies, lies, damn lies, my statistics also from Mark Twain. And then my favorite, uh, he uses statistics as a drunken man and uses lampposts for support rather than illumination. So instead of just using data to help us um, maybe reinforce uh, a, a given uh, perspective on our community, let's use data to help us discover new things about our community and answer the types of questions that, that we all face. And then the last one comes from uh, our esteemed colleague, Dr. Stephen Deller. Ah. In, the, in the end, when you look at secondary data, you should believe it all and trust none of it. So again, look at data, uh, uh, turn it into information whenever possible, but also realize that both primary and secondary data um, can tell us 
many different things. And, and oftentimes we do want to be skeptical in terms of the types of, of uh, conclusions that the data give us. So Steve, I don't know if anything else you want to add to that. No, just one is all that we've been talking about is formal information. We have the hard data, but it's that interpretation and that local knowledge of what's happening is really vital to interpreting this data. Um, so, you know, kind of using this kind of data to spark, this kind of data analysis to spark conversations in the community is a, a, a very legitimate way to kind of engage in a conversation about what's happening, where are we now, where do we look like we're going, and um, what can we do to kind of influence future directions. So with that, uh, we can open up to any other uh, thoughts or, or um, points you might have. Uh, anything that, that stuck out for you? Anything that uh, you'd like to learn more about, for instance? Um, any other thoughts just in general? I'm, I'm curious. Um... So I know that in part one, and just generally speaking, the secondary data sources, um, the higher level you are, so if you go United States or the state or even larger counties or metropolitan statistical areas, the more accurate, the less margin of error and all the other challenges you have with the accuracy of the data. Um, do you have any insight in terms of doing some of these analyses when it comes to our smaller community? So how far down do you wanna burrow down or how far down can you burrow down from like a county or like a smaller um, location to get accurate data? Do you have any guidance on that front? Because I assume that people would be looking at smaller communities in, in many cases. I think Steve and I go back and forth a little bit on this. Um, and I think it depends upon the data set too. So if you're using a data set like the American Community Survey, uh, they do produce a margin of error along with uh, the given um, uh, measure of interest. Um, so my perspective, and I know Steve will provide a different one here in a second, is that if you if you do see a very large margin of error, you know, perhaps maybe um, 10 or 15% of the estimate, use it with caution. Um, you also may wanna look at uh, margins of error when you're comparing uh, different geographies to see uh, if one geographic unit Unit compared to another does have a, a measure that's statistically significant in terms of its difference or a similarity. You know, when you do have large margins of error, um, it may look like one community is very different from another or one measure is very different from another, but if the margin of error is big enough, they may not really be statistically different. So in terms of what we can say from that data set. Um, there's other data sets besides the ACS that I would guess um, suffer from some of the same issues, but uh, do not produce margins of error along with them. Um, I agree with Matt. I mean, as the American Com Community Survey has been going on longer and longer, they're getting more refined in the estimates. And when I say refined, is do you wanna know how many left-handed veterans from the Vietnam War there is in your community? You can probably find that in the American Community Survey. But the confidence interval or the standard error around it is so huge, it's it's a meaningless number. Um, so I think at really fine levels, uh, particularly when you're getting into really fine levels of analysis, be very much aware what that confidence interval is. I think where Matt and I disagree is how much of that do you share with the community? Because I think that if you start reporting out, here's the estimate, and right next to it is the, is the standard error or the confidence interval, you're just gonna confuse the hell out of people. So that's where Matt and I go back and forth. Um, but I think it's something as a data analyst, you need to be very sensitive of and, and aware of, particularly if you're working with quote unquote, tiny towns you know, a, a community with a population of 500 people. We can get through the American Community Survey extremely detailed data, but do you trust that data? Well, 
probably not. So Matt and I agree on 90% of it. It's that 10% that we tend to kind of disagree on. And there's no right answer because as you can see, there's a fair amount of art that enters into this analysis. And you get more comfortable with it the more you do, the, do it. The more you get your hands dirty with the data, the more uh, comfortable you get in terms of what is reasonable to share with the community and what maybe you should hold back in, in your office. All right, and I'm going to stop recording um, because I think those who are here are either not present or genuinely interested or those that are Midwestern and cannot say goodbye quick enough. So I'll stop and this is an opportunity for people to break away if you